whether the sea or land affords better food. By Plutarch, taken from the Symposiacs, translated by William Watson Goodwin. Idepsis in Obeya, where the baths are, is a place by nature every way fitted for free and gentle pleasures, and withal so beautified with stately edifices and dining rooms that one would take it for no other than the common place of repast for all Greece. Here, though the earth and air yield plenty of creatures for the service of men, the sea no less furnishes the table with a variety of dishes, nourishing a store of delicious fish in its deep and clear waters. This place is especially frequented in the spring, for hither at this time of year abundance of people resort, solacing themselves in the mutual enjoyment of all those pleasures the place affords, and at spare hours pass away the time in many useful and edifying discourses. When Callistratus the Sophist lived here, it was a hard matter to dine at any place besides his house, for he was so extremely courteous and obliging that no man whom he invited to dinner could have the face to say him nay. One of his best humours was to pick up all the pleasant fellows he could meet with and put them in the same room. Sometimes he did, as Chimon, one of the ancients, used to do, and satisfactorily treated men of all sorts and fashions. But he always, so to speak, followed Calais, who was the first man, it is said, that daily assembled a number of honorable persons of good mark, and called the place where they met the Praetanium. Several times at these public meetings diverse agreeable discourses were raised, and it fell out that once a very splendid treat adorned with a variety of dainties gave occasion for inquiries concerning food, whether the land or sea yielded better. Here, when a great part of the company were highly commending the land as abounding with many choice, nay, an infinite variety of all sorts of creatures, Polycrates, calling to Symmachus, said to him, But you, sir, being an animal bred between two seas, and brought up among so many which surround your sacred Nicopolis, will not you stand up for Poseidon? Yes, I will, replied Symmachus, and therefore commend you to stand by me, who enjoy the most pleasant part of all the Achaean Sea. Well, says Polycrates, the beginning of my discourse shall be grounded upon custom, for, as of a great number of poets we usually give one, who far excels the rest, the famous name of poet, so, though there be many sorts of dainties, yet custom has so prevailed that fish alone, or above all the rest, is called opsin because it is far more excellent than all others. For we do not call those gluttonous and great eaters who love beef, as Heracles, who after flesh used to eat green figs, nor those that love figs, as Plato, nor lastly those that are for grapes, as Archisalaus, but those who frequent the fish market and soon hear the market bell. Thus when Demosthenes told Philocrates that the gold he got by treachery was spent upon whores and fish, he upbraids him as a gluttonous and lascivious fellow. And Tessaphon said, Pat enough, when a certain glutton cried aloud in the Senate that he should burst asunder. No, by no means let us be baits for your fish. And what was his meaning, do you think, who made this verse? You capers gnaw when you may sturgeon eat. And what, for God's sakes, do those men mean who, inviting one another to sumptuous collations, usually say, Today we will dine upon the shore? Is it not that they suppose, what is certainly true, that a dinner upon the shore is, of all others, most delicious? Not by reason of the waves and stones in that place, for who upon the sea coast would be content to feed upon a pulse or a caper? But because their table is furnished with plenty of fresh fish, Add to this that seafood is dearer than any other, wherefore Cato, in vain against the luxury of the city, did not exceed the bounds of truth when he said that at Rome a fish was sold for more than an ox. For they sell a small pot of fish for a price which a hecatomb of sheep with an ox would hardly bring. Besides, as the physician is the best judge of physic and the musician of songs, so he is able to give the best account of the goodness of meat who is the greatest lover of it. For I will not make Pythagoras and Xenocrates arbitrators in this case, but Antagoras the poet, and Philoxenus the son of Eryxes, 
and Androcades, the painter, of whom it was reported that, when he drew a landscape of Skyla, he drew fish in a lively manner swimming around her, because he was a great lover of them. So Antigonus the king, surprising Antagoras the poet in the habit of a cook, broiling congers in his tent, said to him, Do you think that Homer was dressing congers when he wrote Agamemnon's famous exploits? And he as smartly replied, Do you think that Agamemnon did so many famous exploits when he was inquiring who dressed congers in the camp? These arguments, says Polycrates, I have urged in behalf of fishmongers, drawing them from testimony and custom. But, says Symmachus, I will go more seriously to work, and more like a logician. For if that may truly be said to be a dainty which gives meat the best relish, it would evidently follow that that is the best sort of dainty which gets men the best stomach to their meat. Therefore, as those philosophers who were called elpistics, from the Greek word signifying hope, which above all others they cried up, averred that there was nothing in the world which concurred more to the preservation of life than hope, without whose gracious influence life would be a burden and altogether intolerable. In the like manner, that of all things may be said to get us a stomach to our meat, without which all meat would be unpalatable and nauseous. And among all those things the earth yields, we find no such things as salt, which we can have only from the sea. First of all, there would be nothing edible without salt, which mixed with flour seasons bread also. Hence it was that Poseidon shares a temple with Demeter. Besides, salt is the most pleasant of all relishes, for those heroes who, like champions, use themselves to a spare diet, banishing from their tables all vain and superfluous delicacies, to such a degree that when they encamped by the Hellespont they abstained from fish, yet for all this could not eat fish without salt, which is a sufficient evidence that salt is the most desirable of all relishes. For as colors need light, so tastes need salt, that they may affect the sense, unless you would have them very nauseous and unpleasant. For, as Heraclitus used to say, a carcass is more abominable than dung. Now, all flesh is dead, and part of a lifeless carcass, but the virtue of salt being added to it, like a soul, gives it a pleasant relish and poignancy. Hence it comes to pass that before meat men used to take sharp things, and such as have much salt in them, for these beguile us into an appetite, and whoever has his stomach sharpened with these sets cheerfully and freshly upon all other sorts of meat. But if he begin with any other kind of food, all of a sudden his stomach grows dull and languid, and therefore salt doth not only make meat, but drink, palatable. For Homer's onion, which he tells us they were used to eat before they drank, was fitter for seamen and boatmen than kings. Things moderately salt, by being agreeable to the mouth, make all sorts of wine mild and palatable, and water itself of a pleasing taste. Besides, salt creates none of those troubles which an onion does, but digests all other kinds of meat, making them tender and fitter for concoction so that at the same time it is sauce to the palate and psychic to the body. But all other seafood besides this pleasantness is also very innocent. For though it be fleshy, yet it does not load the stomach as all other flesh does, but is easily concocted and digested. This Zeno will avouch for me, and Crato too, who confines sick persons to a fish diet, as of all others the lightest sort of meat. And it stands with reason that the sea should produce the most nourishing and wholesome food, seeing it yields us the most refined, the purest, and therefore the most agreeable air. You say right, says Lamprius, but let us think of something else to confirm what you have spoken. I remember my old grandfather was used to say in derision of the Jews that they abstain from the most lawful flesh. But we will say that that is the most lawful meat which comes from the sea for we can claim no great right over land creatures which are nourished with the same food, draw the same air, wash in and drink the same water that we do ourselves. And when they are slaughtered, they make us ashamed of what we are doing with their hideous cries. And then again, by living amongst us, they arrive at some degree of familiarity and intimacy with us. But sea creatures are total strangers to us. 
and are born and brought up, as it were, in another world. Neither does their voice, look, or any service they have done us plead for their life. For this kind of creatures are of no use at all to us, nor is there any necessity that we should love them. But that place which we inhabit is held to them, and as soon as they enter upon it, they die. End of Whether the Sea or Land Affords Better Food Taken from the Symposiacs by Plutarch